Captain and Tangela too. And our host, Vincent Van Gogh. Can he bring it to ya? Creature features and all creatures. Let's chat about the year 1933, shall we? Because many extraordinary events occurred during that year, including the fact that it was the worst year of the Great Depression. Construction of the Golden Gate Bridge commenced. There was a horrible drought that created the Dust Bowl in the Midwest. A bloke named Adolf was appointed Chancellor of Germany. Don't look at me, I wasn't even born yet. The first drive-in movie theater opened in Camden, New Jersey. Prohibition was repealed in the United States, and a one-hour and five-minute film starring Lionel Latwell and Faye Ray titled The Vampire Bat was released and may have very well played at the Park Inn Theatre in Camden that same year. Welcome to Creature Features. I am your host, Vincent. The lovely little lass loitering to my left side would be the brilliantly baffling and most beautiful bantling, Tangella. And hailing from Germany, though having nothing at all to do with the appointment of the aforementioned Chancellor, is my loyal and lugubrious land manager, the laudable Mr. Livingston. And do we have a most splendid program in store for you? Firstly, as mentioned prior, we shall present The Vampire Bat from 1933. It's a wonderful classic horror film, which we've shown a time or two before. Tangella informs me that we've only shown this film once prior for episode 97 on October 27th, 2018. She also adds that this particular day in October was mild in temperature, only partly cloudy, and the number one hit in the US at the time was Girls Like You by Maroon 5 and Cardi B. My goodness, Tangella, I know most women have excellent memory skills, but your ability to pull forth these random facts on cue is particularly curious. Perhaps you can use this vast storehouse of knowledge with which you've been endowed to remember to clean up your chambers now and then. Hear, hear. Guest-wise, we'll be joined again by the wonderful author and historian David Skull. He knows everything about classic horror films and maybe even more. He certainly knows a good deal more than you. Oh, do stop being so butthurt, Livingston. You not only made that quip about your home country purely in jest. David will tell us everything we need to know about tonight's film, bring us up to date about his other projects and public appearances, and give us his opinion on more contemporary films. So don't go away, for it is to be another night of Vampire Fright, right here on Creature Features. He's right, you know. Stay tuned. Portions of Creature Features are brought to you by The Winchester Mystery House in San Jose, California. Explore the mystery at winchestermysteryhouse.com. Welcome to Creature Features Saturday night. It's it's a fun night to be watching Creature Features because it's the only night we're on. That's not true anymore, though. We're on Fridays as well now. Yes, I've noticed. Friday oh. nights, Saturday nights. You know, it's it's a and it's streaming a anytime. It's a testimony to my lack of a social life. <laughs> no, it is. I mean, what kind of bloke stays home on a Friday and Saturday night? I bet well, you, you, David Skull, go out and party on well, Friday night. Not since I discovered Creature Features. There you go. I, you, at, ever since last year when I appeared here for the first time, 
I've, I've just fallen in love with the show. Oh, and wonderful. I missed a lot of this. I'm, I'm supposed to be a big you know, horror film historian. Right. Well, in the early 70s, when they did all of these made-for-TV uh, horror movies right. that you specialize in. We love them. Uh, I was going to college in a town that had no television signal. How sad. It was really weird. Uh, there was but I no, bet you were a wonderful student because of that. I fact. was. I ended up right. on the dean's list. Right. But I didn't have uh, uh, TV. There was no cable. There was no home video. There was no streaming. There was no right. nothing. So you so missed I that missed entire decade. Uh, half a decade. Right. And uh, so I'm discovering these things for the first time. How and, fun. And you guys have really nailed... Uh, the, the kind of horror hosting I grew up with. Well, thank uh, you, thank you. And so. By the way, introduction, David Skoll. He is a, a, a scholar on horror, right? Some say, yes. Author, and you, you're like the smartest person we know about these original classic films. No, oh, okay. all we've got is Tom, and he's smart, but he, he hasn't watched all the films you have or not studied them like you have. Well, I have been uh, pretty obsessive about this. Uh, I never thought uh, it was going to become a... Uh, all-consuming uh, uh, preoccupation of my life. You're like the Wikipedia of horror films. Well, people ask me why I write these books, and it was because I grew up as uh, you know a monster kid in the 1960s right. with with all of the the magazines and the model kits and the and the original horror hosts and uh, and then I grew up and somebody asked me if I wanted to write a book about horror movies, and I said. Yeah, but it's going to be difficult because I don't know the backstory of any of these things. I know what I read in the uh, the magazines and this and that, but the, uh, by that time I had a whole career in the theater, and I knew something about the performing arts. And there's always a backstory, and there are always personalities, of course, very big personalities, and well, you have some around here. Um, and uh, so there's there's always something that uh, hasn't been told. Right. And I was lucky enough to start this when a lot of the people from those films in the 20s and 30s were still alive. They were, you know, in their 80s and 90s. And I got to meet some of them and, you know, kind of coax out. You're so some lucky. Juicy stories. No, yeah, we've we've had a few, only a very few that are still around and to meet like some of the big ones like you mentioned. Well, I met, uh, let's see, and uh, I didn't meet Dwight Fry because he died 10 years before I was born, but uh, I did know his son, uh, Dwight Jr., right. who uh, was a, uh, uh, both uh, his father and mother were from the New York theater. And like so much talent, when the talkies came in, there was this migration to Hollywood. Right. And uh, Dwight Fry was part of that. Uh, uh, Bela Lugosi was part of that. Uh, he had a hit in Dracula in, on the stage in New York. Right. And then, uh, but there, there were so many because uh, actors were trained to use their voices. And a lot of directors came from the stage because the directors in Hollywood didn't know right. how to um, handle actors speaking. The actor, uh, the, the director did the talking. it was such a new thing at the time. The director right. did the talking giving an instructions right. and and sometimes they would have a musician on the set and to uh, uh, create a mood but it was uh, a whole new kind of kind of filmmaking and these horror movies were part of it and universal was uh, you know uh, first in line and uh, the other studios wanted to imitate it in fact they wanted to shoot their own cheap horror films on the universal lot and the studios have always you know rented out their right. The, their spaces. So this film we're showing tonight, The Vampire Bat, does it, that fall into the cheap it, stage? It was cheap. It looks much better than it, its budget because right. they shot it on the sets. Of, there were sets from Frankenstein in here, the whole European village, right. uh, from the old dark house, right. the, another James Whale film. Right. And uh, 15 minutes into the film, and, and there are props too. Uh, somebody fi finally just pointed this out to me, and I don't know why I never saw it. But uh, 15 minutes in, in, there's a scene in, in a morgue where they're looking at a woman's dead body. But if you look over to the side, on, on a little shelf, there is the very dragon-shaped uh, candlestick that uh, Bela Lugosi carried down the stairs in, in Dracula. We have to watch for that. I, well, I uh, made a still image and, uh, 
uh, Tom may be able to do something with we'll it. We'll pull it up. We'll pull it up. All right. What do you say we start the film? Okay. And when we come back, uh, we'll talk about uh, some more of the background on this one. The Vampire Bat from 1933. Stick around. You guys, you don't want to miss this film. It's a good one. See you soon. This brief moment of tranquility has been brought to you by Nightscape. Relax and sleep better every single night with this and other videos from our free YouTube channel. Learn more by visiting nightscape.co today. Welcome back. We are watching The Vampire Bat, 1933, with Mr. David Skull. He's a, an expert on these things. No, so you're I'm like told. a ninja. A ninja? Right. You, you fight the, the unknowledgeable and give them knowledge. That is your power. I'll, I'll, right? I'll go with that. Right? That's Thank good. You. That's yes. good. So this film, uh, lots of bats, lots of vampire bats. Lots of vampire bats, although it, the villagers don't believe it's the bat that's doing the, the blood sucking. They blame it all on uh, uh, kind of a simple-minded uh, 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 unfortunate, uh, played by Dwight Fry, who right. was Renfield in Dracula. A simple-minded unfortunate. I, you know, I'm, I'm gonna put that into my lexicon because that's such a wonderful phrase. You have to be careful uh, the, the kind of words you use to describe right. people with, with disabilities these days. Right, but uh, he right. is definitely, uh, this is a kind of uh, character who you wouldn't see in yeah. Uh, too many movies today. I like the fact that there's villages as well. And, yeah. they're, an and they're angry villagers. We, I, I would like to live in a village where there's villages. But not angry ones. Not angry villages. Who are not angry at me. Well. Right. That would be best. So uh, this film, you say, was made on the Universal lot. It was made on the Universal lot, and it was made uh, by Majestic Pictures, which was a small independent outfit. Um, and it uh, capitalized on the fact that uh, the Universal films were very, very popular by that time. Universal had really uh, cornered the market mm -hmm. on horror films, but uh, Warner Brothers wanted to get into the act, and so they had done um, Dr. X with Lionel Atwill and Faye Ray, right. and it was a Technicolor, two-strip Technicolor. It was an early version of right. Technicolor. And uh, so that was a gimmick that really drew them in. And it was followed by one called uh, The Mystery of the Wax Museum, again with Atwill and, and Ray. Right. And uh, Majestic uh, thought they would capitalize on using both the stars and uh, its own half-hearted uh, uh, stab at color. Uh, in, the, in the later chase scenes where you see the character, uh, where you see the villagers carrying torches as they uh, hunt down poor Herman. Uh, originally, the uh, individual frames of the film were painted yellow and red. And so uh, there were suddenly color uh, torches going oh across goodness. the way. And uh, so uh, they um, had their small scale version right. of the Warner Brothers uh, color. Now, Fay Ray, what was her appeal in all these horror films. I was she in King Kong and she uh, she like Lionel Atwill uh, came to Hollywood. Um, uh, they both had uh, stage backgrounds right. and um, did various things, but they found uh, their, 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 their real stride doing these thrillers right. and became and they both became associated with the genre. Faye was uh, the first scream queen as right. we call them today. Right. She really truly was. And uh, she did Dr. X, and she did The Vampire Bat, and she did The Mystery of the Wax Museum, The Most Dangerous Game, which was all about uh, 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 human, human trof hunting. trophy hunting, human. and then King Kong, right. which 
earned her a place in heaven forever. Right, right. Uh, Everybody and remembers her from that. Atwill uh, uh, was a, uh, came from the West End Theater and via the New York Theater, and then he came west with the migration of talent. And uh, he specialized in Shaw and Ibsen and classical theater. Right. But uh, uh, Hollywood, like because of his very deep, resonant, mellifluous voice, uh, it made him very good for villains and, uh, you know, uh, um, very authoritarian figures. And, and he, uh, I, I wouldn't say type, he wasn't typecast in the same way other actors, but, but he, he usually played something that had a uh, villainous edge to it and uh, very much uh, a forerunner of the kind of parts Vincent Price would play. In fact, the mystery of the Wax Museum was remade as House of Wax, which established Price as a uh, really, but that as, was originally Atwell's. That was that was that was Atwell's. Right, and his career uh, crashed and burned in the '40s because of a uh, a sex scandal. Oh no! Uh, that he oh, was yes. involved in. He was involved in. He right. threw a uh, a wild party at his uh, home in Hollywood, and like a lot of people uh, in the business, who had their own movie theaters at home and projection equipment, uh, they liked to show their friends. Stag movies, as they oh were called in porno, right? And uh, apparently, uh, people were there uh, watching them in the all together, and there were uh, some reports of sexual assault, and and uh, he got into trouble not so much for that, but he wouldn't uh, he wouldn't snitch on the people who had attended. Oh wow! And as a result, he uh, didn't go to jail, but. Uh, uh, he got, I think, five years probation, Good Lord. and uh, his career was kind of in the ashes after after that. Well, Although he still would show up uh, in the uh, in the forties in uh, in various films, some of them for Universal, but uh, a really wonderful uh, performer. And everybody else was watching these movies too, right. Right. and having wild parties and orgies. And, he just so got caught. He got caught. He got caught, and, sadly. Uh, but uh, Hollywood's always been like that. Right, right. What do you say we get back to the film? Let's do it. All right, let's get back to the vampire bat. When we come back, we're going to hear some more interesting facts about this film from Mr. David Skull. So don't you dare go away. And uh, well, we're going to do mail next. But then after we do mail, we'll be back with Mr. Skull. See you soon. Portions of this program are brought to you by Micromat, making products that keep your Macintosh running at its best. Welcome back to the show. We are going to do some mail because uh, we, we got mail, actually. We have actually gotten mail. Yeah, we've received mail. And if we receive mail, it is our obligation by law, according to the Supreme Court, that we should read our mail. I beg your pardon? No, it's a new law they just came up with. No, it's a new lie I just came up with, but it's the same. You watch way too much television. Right. No, well, David stepped away because I think he's going to go get a copy of his book. He's going to sign it. And it's going to say, Dear Mr. Livingston, read this book so you are not such a skeptic of horror films. <sighs> yeah? All right. How about some mail, Mr. Livingston? Speaking of book, there's book? one from West Yorkshire. Oh. Britain. He's from Britain. Look at this. Wow. Customs declaration. He declared it had a value of 10 pounds. That's a lot. 10 quid for this book. All right. Oh, this looks interesting. Let's read the letter first. Why don't you look at this before I look at it? That way I can see what's going on here. All right, this is from Graham Jenkinson in Dewsbury, West Yorkshire. You know, we don't have anybody named Graham here. That's it's, it's a purely English name. You never see anybody here in this country named Graham. I believe it's Scottish, but. Is it Scottish? Graham. Well, there's a lot of Grahams in England. Yeah, Perhaps. we need more Grahams here. And we need somebody to open a cracker company named Graham. 
I think it's been done. No, it's just, it's not, it's not a trademark. That's the thing. It needs to be a trademark. Graham's crackers. Graham's crackers. All right, he goes, greetings from the UK, and I hope that you're all well. Vincent Tenjo and Livingston are here with us every night via YouTube. Thank you so much for your show, Creature Features. Great movies, great guests, and great memories. I'm sending you my latest book of short stories and poems, all horror-based. I hope you enjoy the book, and I would love your opinion on what you find within. Would it be possible to have a autograph photograph of you all to add to my horror collection? I think we might be able to pull that off, sir. Best wishes to you all, Graham and Angie. Keep up the good work. The show is brilliant. Regards, Graham. Well, thank you so much, Graham. Show me the book. What is it? Is it good? A good book. Vampire Journal. Audie String Guy. Oh, put up a big picture. But, uh, oh, look at this. This is, this is wonderful. This is easy reading. This is the kind of book I can read. You know, when it's got the dense text. No, it, it makes me tired. It makes me go to sleep. I never finish a book like that, but this one I could finish. This is wonderful. Thank you so much for sending it. Next up, Mr. Livingston. We have an email with a photograph. Oh, I like emails with photographs. It appears to be two photographs. Two photographs. All right. This is from Jack. This is Jack. 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 We showed a film recently about Jack the Ripper. Not the same bloke, I hope. All right. Uh, hello from Livermore, home of world-class wineries and birthplace of the H-bomb. Really? No, we know Livermore. Livermore Labs. <clears throat> Livermore Labs. No, but we drive by Liver Livermore when we go to Los Angeles. Yes. To get to Highway 5. Livermore is right by Highway 5. So he goes, uh, my wife and I have been Creature Feature fans since early in the Bob Wilkins era and love your continuance of the show. My wife, Lenny, is turning 65 next month and I've already bought for her Tom's new film as a birthday present. That would be Tom, our director's... Uh, which, I wonder which film she bought. It must have been the Creature Feature one, right? Uh, right, right. When I noticed that her actual birthday, September 10th, was on one of your broadcast days, I thought I'd better write and ask if you could send her a happy birthday during the letters section of that show. Well, obviously, we're too late for that. However, a happy birthday, late, happy belated birthday. And, you know, for those of you sending us birthday requests like this, you have to send them, like, a long time ahead of time, right? Four weeks at least. Four weeks at least. Well, no, but we've got to go through all the mail. Sometimes we get a big stack of mail. It's so big that it's taller than Tangela. Two months at least. Two months. No, a year. A year would a be year. good. No, a year might be too much. All right. Two months and seven days, maybe. Uh, by the way, I loved your playing Mars under the opening of last night's show. But to clear up one common misconception, John Williams did not rip off Gustav Holst in the Star Wars score. In an old interview, he said that Lucas originally wanted to use the planets in the movie with Williams providing incidental music. Williams suggested that he could write a score in the whole style that would be much better integrated. Fortunately, Lucas agreed, and I agree as well. And he includes some photos. Look at this. He's a mad scientist. We're going to put some big ones up here, but he is a, a genuine... This is the way mad scientists should dress. Not okay. the way... No, no. I, uh, the, the, the blokes at Livermore Lab do not dress like this. Thank goodness. No, it's not thank goodness. They have no class or style, whereas Jack does. Thanks for writing, Jack. And happy birthday, Leslie. What's Leslie, right? Andrew in New Zealand. Andrew in New Zealand. Just want to say, keep up the good. I wait all week for the new show to be posted. My wife always knows when I'm watching your show when she hears the music. Again, thank you, Andrew in New Zealand. Oh, he works for this company. It's called Sportino. It's got this neat logo. Do you see this? Running man. It's a little bloke kicking a soccer ball, I hmm. think. Yeah, somebody gave me a, a, a rash of trouble the other day because I called the sport soccer. Heaven for fan. Well, it's not football. It is football. No, it was, it's called football over there, but the original name of the game is soccer. The Americans say it correctly and the Europeans do not. I learned this from Wikipedia. That is the last letter. That's it? Thank goodness. All right. If you'd like to send a letter of your own by email, send it to the address right here. But make sure you include where you're from because we like making fun that of That would be good to city. know. It's good to know. That's why. And uh, if you'd like to send something in the post, like a wonderful book that you or possibly wrote or you possibly did not write, send it to the address you see right here. 
We'll be back soon with Mr. David Skull, but first let's get back to the Vampire Bat. Store.com, the official merchandiser of Creature Feature Accessories. David Skull, famous historian of horror. Do you ever color your hair? Do I, should I? No. Well, no, it looks lovely, but have you ever done it? <laughs> no, I haven't. Yeah. I'm thinking you of have, stopping. Though, you? No, I think my hair is almost as gray as yours. Oh. It is. No. Maybe. I don't know. I was covering it with paint. But that's, uh, <laughs> that's neither here nor there. The Vampire Bat. Fun film. You know a lot it's, about this film. It's... I I've, uh, hadn't watched it in years until uh, you asked me to come on. I, I've watched it several times recently. And uh, there are so many connections to, you know, to Universal. Give me 15. Uh, 15? Well, I, let me, I just start. The uh, Melvin Douglas, who appears uh, As? in, What's in he this do? film, he is the, uh, the, the, male, the second male lead after, after Atwell, right. who, uh, whose love interest is Fay Ray. Uh, he was uh, one of the stars of The Old Dark House. And, oh. and if you watch The Old Dark House, you can see him walking up and down some of the same staircases. Now, we recently we, showed the 1963 version of that film. Which has nothing to do with the... Uh, not related uh, at all. Not, so it's not considered a remake, just the same name? It's, uh, yeah, basically. Right, right. I, I think it may, it may have, uh, they may have acquired the rights to the, uh, uh, the original novel, but... Uh, didn't do much with it, right? But the, uh, but all kinds of people pop up. The uh, Lionel Belmore, who plays the, uh, the burgermeister in in this film, uh, sometimes he's a burger burgermeister, sometimes he's a burgomaster. Yeah, what, uh, what, what is a burgermeister? Is that a, a mayor? mayor? Yeah, basically. Mayor. Mm. And uh, but he did that for Universal all the time. He was the, uh, the burgomaster in in Frankenstein for Universal, and uh, he was another British actor. He worked uh, uh, with the great Victorian actor, uh, Henry Irving, who, mm. uh, so he knew Bram Stoker, who wrote Dracula. The Bram Stoker. Bram Stoker was Henry oh, Irving's uh, uh, right-hand man and would have signed Lionel Belmore's paychecks. My goodness. And uh, his sister, Daisy Belmore, was uh, another British actress who appears in Dracula in, as one of the passengers in the, uh, uh, the coach at the very beginning of the film. Wow. And uh, I'm sure there are, I haven't done it, but I bet you can go through these films looking for props and pieces of furniture and-, and Of course. And uh, it, it's How really many times have we seen that same Jacob's Ladder? Uh, that one, I, was tr I, I couldn't quite, uh, quite place it. It looks like one of the ones from Frankenstein, but I don't think it's from Frankenstein. Oh, no. Somebody will tell me I'm wrong, but uh, the, uh, it was all at their disposal at right. Universal. And the art director for the Vampire, Back was, uh, Vampire Bat was uh, uh, Danny Hall, who uh, created all of those wonderful sets for Dracula, Frankenstein, Bride of Frankenstein. Those are incredible. And, uh, I mean, he really created the whole look right. of, of the Universal films. And it was probably his idea to, to bring out that, uh, you know, the candlestick uh, that Lugosi used. Right, right. And, uh, and as the film goes on, you can see uh, Dwight Fry uh, borrowing from his portrayal of Renfield. He does, uh, uh, does that laugh. <laughs> which uh, Dwight Fry Jr. told me that uh, when he'd go out and, uh, to a restaurant and use his American Express card, waiters would come back 
to him and had it and say, <laughs> no. Yes. That's wonderful. <laughs> well, it's, it's a compliment. It is wonderful. Uh, and uh, there, there are many moments that, that come straight out of, out of Dracula. Uh, Fry, he was a very good actor. He was, very, he was a very versatile stage actor. He did a lot of comedy, right. which Hollywood didn't give him the chance to do. I mean, he became rapidly uh, typecast as, you know, the monster, the monster sidekick, uh, you know, the hunchback laboratory assistant. Igor. Uh, not, he didn't play Igor, uh, but he played uh, Fritz, the, uh, uh, the little hunchback in uh, Frankenstein right. who helped the doctor and uh, never got away from that sort of thing. And uh, he played the Peter Lorre part in the very first version of the Maltese Falcon. And, uh, but it was bizarro kind of parts that, uh, that got him. And his career just didn't take off. Um, and he died uh, prematurely uh, in 1944, I think it was. Uh, he was a devout Christian scientist and uh, had concealed a heart condition from his family and refused to, you know, uh, employ right. uh, conventional medicine. And uh, he took his son to a movie matinee uh, in Los Angeles one Saturday and uh, on the bus on the way back died of a heart attack. That's depressing. It was very depressing. Yeah. And uh, uh, he could have done so much. And it's a shame we don't have a real you know, recorded record of all the things he did on the stage right. in, uh, in New York. Uh, but he appeared with all the big stars. He, he didn't do leads but he appeared on stage with Frederick March and uh, with Bela Lugosi, not in Dracula, but in, uh, in other stage plays. And, uh, and he is a favorite. And I think uh, uh, it, it, it's, it is that laugh, that maniacal laugh right, in, right. in Dracula. And uh, uh, nobody has done it better. And that's why... Uh, it's his trademark now. That's what, in uh, Dracula Dead and Loving It, uh, Peter McNichol does the most incredible imitation of Dwight Fry through the whole movie he, in the Renfield part. Right, right. But it, it's more than an homage. I mean, he just channels <laughs> completely. But uh, oh, it's the part that everybody want, uh, wanted. Uh, they wanted Lou, Universal wanted Lou Ayers to play Renfield in Dracula. Of course, he went on to be Dr. Kildare and, right. and that. And, uh, Oh, excuse me, excuse me. They wanted him to play John Harker, the uh, ineffectual leading man. And he said, no, I want to play Renfield. That's the, the, oh, the, nice. uh, the, the part uh, to do. And of course, it's the plummiest part. Right. Uh, he, he doesn't quite upstage Lugosi, but he, he walks away with a lot of the film. Right. And, um, and of course, his is the, the only real story going on. He has the most to gain and the most to lose. Uh, will he get eternal life? Will Dracula ever appreciate him? Uh, and uh, it doesn't go well for him, but uh, he's got the real dramatic arc right. in, in Dracula. And here he has another tragic arc and uh, he is not permitted to, it's not a spoiler. I don't think anybody watching is expecting him to make it to the end of the right. film, but uh, great, great, great actor. and. Uh, I was, uh, when I was doing my first book, Hollywood Gothic, uh, uh, his son was also living in New York, uh, working in the theater still, and uh, came down to my office and just brought a bunch of his father's original scrapbooks. And it was, it was just, just amazing to, uh, it was like getting into a time capsule. Right, right. And uh, there was, there that's was no- That's nice that that stuff's still saved. It's- uh, In existence. It's great. So I've, mm -hmm. uh, over the course of my career, I haven't collected originals, but boy, I've photographed a lot of, a lot of scrapbooks and things like that. There's a, there's a record right. of them. They're, they're just... You need to keep them digitally, cases uh, of fire. Let's say we get back to this film, and uh, when we come back, we're going to find out about some of your books and some of the other okay. things you've done as well, right? We will. All right, off we go, back to The Vampire Bat in 1933. Don't you dare go away. More fun stuff coming around the corner. This 
is Brian Borden from Michigan. I just wanted to say hi to Tangela, Vincent, and Mr. Livingston. I love your show. I found you in February of 2020, and you guys helped me through some very trying times. I'd like to request The Legend of Lizzie Borden, since I am her great, 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 great nephew. I'd love to see that movie with Elizabeth Montgomery. Bye. This is Livingston, and you're watching Creature Features. Not now. Stay tuned. Welcome back. If you are just joining us, I, I don't know what to say. I mean, they, they've missed most of the movie. They've missed most of the interview. I think they should just watch Saturday Night Live. <laughs> or what's left of that, you're too late for that as well. So who knows? Anyways, we are with uh, Mr. David Skull. He knows everything about this film and many more. And you've got two books we're going to talk about, right? Two books, uh, especially this year. I've been doing this now for... Uh, some of my books are uh, approaching their 30th anniversaries. My goodness. Uh, and they've stayed in print, and um, I've been able to revise them, which is good because, you know, you spend a lot of time working on these things, and then the book is published, and then somebody contacts you with, uh, oh, I loved your book, and... By the way... Here's, by the way, here's something you didn't <laughs> know right. about. And so I've been able to uh, constantly uh, uh, expand and revise and clarify and sometimes just fix dumb mistakes that uh, only I know about. Uh, but uh, two of my books, uh, Hollywood Gothic, uh, The Tangled Web of Dracula from Novel to Stage to Screen, was my first nonfiction book in this, uh, uh, in this new stage of my life that started in 1990. Uh, is finally an audio book that oh, wow. I, have, uh, I have performed. Uh, I, I did, um, I've done audio commentaries and I've uh, narrated some documentaries and people seem to like to listen own. to me and they, I've, I've, uh, people have been telling me for a long time, why don't you do an audio book? Right. Well, finally an audio book publisher asked me and uh, so uh, that was done simultaneously with uh, Dark Carnival, The Secret World of Todd Browning, the man who directed the movie of Dracula but also uh, Freaks, one of the uh, right. the great uh, scandalous films of the uh, the 1930s. Wonderful film. So both these books uh, uh, deal with uh, a lot of Dracula, and uh, it was a fascinating experience because uh, it's a lot more time consuming than you you would think. Right. The uh, I mean, I basically for each book I spent uh, about 20 hours total. Uh, recording them for less than 10 hours of you know finished material right, because you have to do retakes you do retakes and uh, and, and and you cough and you flub right and uh, it's never smooth now did you do this in a studio or just at home in a state-of-the-art studio right and uh, and I'm glad because I really <laughs> I really appreciated the uh, the technical help I got right and then they go through it with computers and they stabilize and standardize the amount of space between words and the amount wow. of space between sentences. But you, the, the first day was kind of rough because uh, I've done a lot of public speaking and I've had some, some theater training. And uh, your, the, your first instinct is you want to project. But with an audiobook, you don't. Yeah. It's, it's very intimate. You want to be quiet. Right. You want to hardly do anything. Right. And um, so I think it got better and better as the two weeks went That's on. Interesting. But and uh, but they're uh, they're out for the Halloween season, uh, and they are uh, right now they're available for pre-order on 
on Amazon and and uh, do you have a Audible. website that we could go to? And my, my website monstershow.net. Monstershow.net. And uh, there will be a CD version. There will be streaming versions. Uh, oh, wonderful! And uh, I hope people will, will will enjoy them. Well, they'll go visit the site, and uh, they have all the links there to Amazon would, and all that. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. Good. There you go. Well, let's say we get back to the film, eh? All right. Off we go. Back to the vampire bat. Don't you dare go away. See you soon. Hello, this is Mr. Livingston. It would appear I have been tasked with requesting you to help our show financially by visiting our patron page. Your generosity will help us keep Creature Features on the air. With only a few dollars a month from you, your kindness will allow us to continue creating new entertainment for your viewing pleasure each and every week. And if you have the desire to give more, you might even receive a gift from Tangela. I think not. Please visit the website below to learn more. Thank you. This is Livingston, and you're watching Creature Features. Not now. Uh, stay tuned. Creature Features is brought to you by CreatureFeatureStore.com, the official merchandiser of Creature Feature accessories. Bats, bats, bats. There's bats all over the place in this film. You know, you think somebody would come out with a big can of spray raid and just shoot them all down? Uh, you, you would think, but one would think it's a horror movie. People it don't is. do the logical the thing. The movie would end too quickly. Yes, that's right. That's right. I keep forgetting these things. In any case, let's not talk about this film anymore. I want to talk about Nosferatu because it's a big, big deal. It's a big deal this year because it is the 100th anniversary of Nosferatu. 100 which years. The very first Dracula film. And uh, it has a lot to do with my book, Hollywood Gothic, because uh, I discovered in my research that uh, uh, Florence Stoker, the widow of Bram Stoker, found out about Nosferatu in, uh, and that it was supposedly a freely adapted version right. of Dracula to which she owned the rights. Right. And it was a total plagiarism. It was a total ripoff. And they were brazen about uh, uh, selling it in Germany and around the world. And she took them to court for, uh, for years, this obsessive legal battle to the death and it was such a juicy story and I found all the correspondence in England uh, at the British Library nobody had wow. taken a look at it or quoted it before and it was just like a novel and the, uh, she was a character and everybody around her was a character 
And uh, so the book was all about uh, all the people who tried to uh, control Dracula, make money from Dracula, and uh, usually ruin their, 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 their own lives in the process. And, uh, but Nosferatu is uh, a great example of German expressionism. Um, Dracula in the film is not at all like Bela Lugosi. No. He uh, is not suave. He is not uh, seductive. Right. He is a uh, rat-like creature with uh, insect-like uh, right. fingers. And what was the actor? Who Max Schreck. Max Schreck. Who's, that was his wow. real name, and right. it actually means terror in German. Wow. And uh, fortunately, even though Florence Stoker got the courts to uh, order all prints and the negative destroyed, uh, it escaped to various corners of the right. world. And it was only in relatively recent years that we've seen the film as it uh, uh, was originally intended. And this is the 100th anniversary 100 of the film. Years. And in just uh, another eight and a half years, uh, Dracula and Frankenstein are gonna have their 100th anniversary. And My goodness. I, I can't promise I'll be around, but uh, uh, that'll be worth looking forward to. But. Nor can I promise that we'll ever be able to show those films, even century-old <laughs> cinema. No, those are universal. Well, unless they, they might it. go into the public domain. They will or they won't? If Congress pulls, uh, you know, a Disney and, uh, right. ex you know, extends the copyright, then maybe not. But uh, they are coming up to the end of their, uh, what was supposed to be the end of their, of their copyright. Right. Something will happen. Something will get switched. Somebody will be elected and it won't happen. <laughs> All right. Well, what do you say we finish up this film? Let's do it. And then uh, when we come back, we'll talk about what you're doing next. Okay. All right. Off we go to the end of the vampire bat. Don't you dare go away because Tangela is going to be here. And if she knows that you've left, she's going to send you a gift in the mail and you won't like it. This brief moment of tranquility has been brought to you by Nightscape. Relax and sleep better every single night with this and other videos from our free YouTube channel. Learn more by visiting nightscape.co today. the coffin lid down on the vampire bat it was the doctor and his assistant yeah you knew already i you know i i forgot about this movie and i completely forgot that was going to happen what did you think of the film you liked it she always likes the it black and white ones for some reason it has more of a nostalgia quotient than a lot of it does because of its it association does. with other better films no it, does. it has that whole motif going it on it pulls you in it pulls it pulls us all in it's <laughs> like it's like a Venturi or like a, yeah. a hurricane or, mm -hmm. or a whirlpool or something silly like that. Anyways, what's up next for David Skoll? What's up next for me? Well, Nosferatu is still keeping me busy this year. I've been asked to uh, introduce screenings all, all around the country oh, how fun. and all around the world. I, in June, I went to uh, Santiago, Chile for no. a, uh, an amazing... I've always uh, wondered, is it actually Chile in Chile? Chile. It's a chilly, no. Is it chilly in Chile? Well, it's summer, so it was winter there, and it was oh. chilly. It was chilly. Yes. Right. But uh, the people were wonderful. The people were warm. The people were warm right. and friendly, right. and uh, they love movies. They love cinema. They take it seriously. And they had a week-long celebration of everything Nosferatu. Oh, my goodness. And uh, I had a blast. We need to get on a Chilean TV station. And I'm working on a new book now. Uh, uh, called I Hear America Screaming, the, oh. po the Politics of Horror. 
The Politics of Horror. And this is probably, I'm going to get death threats after this one. Why? But uh, because it's about the politics of horror and politics. And uh, so the politics inside of horror films. No, the, how, uh, the, <laughs> the politics of our real world uh, take oh. their lead from horror films. And oh, horror I motifs. see. Oh, all and right. It's all about telling scary stories. Oh, all right. Now you're, you're drawing parallels. Oh, yes. Is what you're doing. There are two. I don't have to draw them. Just I, right. how many of them can I deal with? No. Politicians are scary people. You bet. No, no. I could see. So we should make a horror film. That's all politicians. I do it. And then, and then the citizens could be the zombies. They always are. Right, right. Yeah, that's wonderful. Well, that sounds like fun. And it, then you live in Glendale still. I still live in Glendale. You know, I used to bounce around Glendale near Forest all the Lawn. Time. Right. Probably more dead movie stars there than anywhere in the world. Oh, that's a great place. I love, I love cemeteries. I love. She loves cemeteries too. But when I bring her along, she brings a shovel. Ah. No, and immediately we get kicked out. There, there are cemeteries in this area that say Changella is not allowed. No, it's, it's a true story. I no, no, kind of so understand sad. that. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming up again, David. And next time you're in town, you come see us. And by then, you'll probably have five more books written. Probably. Right. And uh, if you've got any movie suggestions for us, you do let us know, right? I will. All right. And as far as you guys go, thank you for staying up and watching the show. We know you could be sleeping or making cookies or making explosives like she does. But instead, you decide to watch our show. And for that reason, we love you. We'll see you next week. Different movie, different guests. Don't know who, don't know what, but it'll be fun. See you then. So, uh, David, yes. we're thinking of doing a little horror movie. Oh. And if we do this, I'm thinking maybe you could do the audio commentary. Well, yeah, but uh, I think I'd be left speechless. <laughs>